Oh, hello. Oh, what a surprise. I didn't I expect did. that. I didn't know we were doing a show. What? Hello and welcome to Normal World. My name is Dave Lando. My name is Quarter Black Garrett. And what? Who? Who? Angela. Hey. Hi. You're over oh. there. Sorry. We came Ooh, in look. hot. Coming oh, on. Oh, she's surprised Summer. too. Coming in hot. Oh, man. Joining us today is a comedian you can see at the comic strip in New York, March. It is March, right? 15th and 16th. And yes. a Catch a Rising Star in New Jersey, Princeton, New Jersey, that is, on the 22nd and 23rd of this very month. Please welcome to the show, Allie Breen. Hi, guys. Thank you for coming in. Thanks for having me. It's Thanks. For, thank you for the applause. I meant I was <laughs> every, also clap. There we go. That's perfect. Every guest gets it. Yeah. Oh, it's not <laughs> awkward. <laughs> not at all. As, as always. Two applause. That helps. Yes, it always helps when two people <laughs> clap. It's like my set. <laughs> And then today, I'd also like to <laughs> announce, uh, we have a guest right now on the, on the horn. Is oh. that what the kids still call it? Nope. Uh, no? Oh, right. Uh, I, I'm embarrassed. Uh, he began his professional career as an actor when he was uh, 12 years old, having been cast by Francis Ford Coppola to play the son of Jeff Bridges in the movie Tucker, The Man in His Dream. You may also remember him from Parker Lewis' Can't Lose. Check out his new book. Uh, coming actually, no, I'm sorry, it did come out already. What am I saying? Creating a character for the stage or life. Please welcome Corin Nemec. What's happening? Hey, I really like your opening music, by the way. I was, uh, I was into that, right? I was feeling it. It was Thanks, groovy. Man. Thank you, yeah, sir. Could I, I could have foregone this whole entire interview and just sat there and listened to that for the next, you know, half hour. Yeah, dude, that's what we try to do. <laughs> it's good, it's chill. We'd like people to relax a bit. And was, get uncomfortable. Yeah, you achieved. You achieved your goal, my friends. I love it. Was Francis Ford Coppola hiring you your first film role? Yeah, that was my first film role. Previous to that, I had done a handful of commercials uh, for like Kool Aid and 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 uh, Lee Jeans and Suzuki motorcycles and 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 uh, McDonald's and some other stuff. But uh, I had all uh, of those yeah, was, today. <laughs> <laughs> everything all <laughs> that's hilarious uh but and i had done the only other thing i had done uh, that was that was outside of commercials was an episode of the tv show sidekicks with ernie reyes jr and gil gerard um you know and th that was it and so i it was a huge deal for me it was a game changer that's what uh, that's what put me on the map shall we say as as an actor in the industry at that time it's incredible, man. What what uh, what do you get most recognized for? What character? Uh, you know, it depends where where I'm at in the world, but uh, I, I would say that it it fluctuates between like Parker Lewis and then also uh, Stargate and mm. uh, and then uh, that guy from those Lifetime movies. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I want to ask a question. What's your favorite monster movie that you've done? Because you've done a lot. Oh, it's a, it's a toss. Yes, I've done them all. Dracano. Mm -hmm. um, Robo Cobra. Ro Robo, Robo, uh, Robo Croc. Uh, yes. I also did a comedy, Robo Doc, with David Faustino uh, a number of years ago. Oh, that's National awesome. Film. From Married with Children. And uh, yeah, but and then I've, 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 uh, I did Mansquito. And raging sharks, yep. and, sand and sharks, all kinds of ones. Well, that was one of my favorites. It's a toss-up between sand sharks and um, and dragon wasps. Uh, Drone wars was okay too, but dr sand sharks and, and dragon wasps I produced as well, and I had a lot more creative input on those, and uh, and we we hammed them up and and brought out the comedy as much as possible because. You know, the CGI is the CGI. Yeah. What are you going to do? You can have fun. It's, That's what I love about fun. those movies. You, they look yeah, so fun. fun. Well, I, I was just saying how I always wanted to do B movies. I mean, I made one, but it's like a D movie. But it's <laughs> uh, like, it's a, it, those are cool to me. I don't know. Yeah. I, I think they're fun. Yeah. The campier, the better. They're so good when they're that way. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And I, I've, I don't know. I don't watch Lifetime movies. No offense. But <laughs> for me, I, no, very none, none, none taken. I, I don't. I've literally, I think I've only watched half of one of the 12 or 14 that I've been in. I'd also, yeah. <laughs> I've, I've probably watched all of them. I've probably seen everyone. <laughs> That's another question. Yeah, I've never been a romantic lead. Yeah. I could be a fat friend. You know, yeah, a sidekick. Yeah. yeah. Do you, are you one of the actors that don't like to watch their own stuff or do you love to watch the movies that you make? 
No, it all it all just depends on on uh, on on what the film was, and uh, you know what my experience was like on it. All of that, how how dynamic the story is, mm-hmm. and you know, and also I I, I got at, at a certain point it was like some of these movies I don't even know when they're coming out. I mean, everything you know they're all over the place. Right. I it's just I have no clue. Sometimes they pop up here and there, and I'll catch half of one or, or whatever. I, I don't need to watch my stuff. There's some stuff that I do enjoy watching uh, just because of the quality of it, like like the miniseries The Stand. I could watch that over and over again. That's the original, incredible. Thing, not the remake. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and, I, and I played a, a significant role in that, but I'd watch it because of, because of watching it, you know? I mean, I recently watched uh, Operation Dumbo Drop with some family and because uh, they had never seen it. A uh, Disney film yeah. I did with Ray Liotta and Danny Glover and, and, uh, and and um, Dennis Leary, Dougie Doug, great, yeah, great, great movie. movie. And sure, uh, yeah, and, and you know, and, and I really enjoy watching that one. I don't really put my, I, I take myself out of it. I, I don't really see myself in it when I'm watching it. I see whichever character I'm playing, you know. What was your most challenging role you think that you've done so far? Ooh, probably, probably, uh, Having to play uh, uh, the serial killer, um, Ted, uh, Bundy? Ted Bundy. Yeah, Ooh. yeah. It wasn't not that it was not that it was tough uh, to achieve the dramatic performance of the character or to accomplish the nuances of uh, of of that that guy, but it was the embracing the fact that this dude was totally sane mm-hmm. and really excited and turned on by what his what his ultimate, you know, goals were in life, which was kidnapping, uh, raping, murdering, and then right. re-raping the corpses of the murdered girls that were previously raped. And, yeah. I mean, the guy was just a total. Uh, you just don't get any dark. I mean, I'm sure you can get darker than this guy. It's pretty but dark. I, I don't, yeah. I, dark. You know, and I just playing him after, you know, I played other guys who who were dark characters, Richard Speck and some other ones that were not that that were not uh, based on real life. uh, Brothers Keeper, Blackout and some other films that that I did. Blackout was with Jane Seymour and Brothers Keeper was with Gene Triplehorn. uh, uh, John Badham directed that, who I acted I I acted under on Drop Zone with Wesley Snipes and Gary Busey and. Yeah, it's about awesome, yeah. that, that cast. So, uh, but uh, but yes, but so uh, but after like four four or five days of playing that guy, I was like so sick of it. I was just so <laughs> nauseated by it. Mm. I every day driving home from set, I was just. It, I, I had to shake it off, and I'm not a method actor or anything, so I don't normally have to shake off the performances I'm doing. That wasn't the, that wasn't the. In fact, that's what my book is about primarily is the, the the method that I studied under or mastered under, I guess you could say, with my teacher Manu Tupo, which was called the New Era Acting Technique, and and he taught that at the American Repertory Company in Hollywood. I was studied under him from '94 to 2004. Uh, he had to retire from acting in 2005 and passed away shortly after unfortunately but uh, uh but uh but just an incredible teacher i i it really i didn't i couldn't fully digest the dynamic uh philosophy that he that he was suggesting for us until many years after he passed away when it went when a lot of what you know because uh, there was my life was so busy I, I was so caught up in in everything that was going on i didn't really have time to digest the digest it it worked great for me in my acting but his philosophy was also for life, and I think that that's mm. where the uh, where, where the interesting twist is on on the book and his teaching technique. But that's a uh, a different subject. But uh, no, absolutely. Uh, it's subject, but it's a, <laughs> but but that said, so I didn't. My, it's a creationist technique where you don't adopt anything from your own life or anything like that. You just create the personality, the character, and and at the end of the day, you can box that thing up and put it away way and pick it up when you need it you know like a cheap yeah. suit it's not, it's not a big deal it's not like i have to go digging around in my past to figure out what dark horrible things i may have have happened to me or you know oh what a, you know i don't know i made i made uh, we were supposed to be dissecting a frog one time and i made it break dance for a little bit before we got into the dissection i don't know we've Maybe all that done was, that <laughs> yeah, you yeah. know <laughs> yeah that's what that's i was gonna ask you book, again it's called creating a character for the yeah. stage or life and that is available i was going to ask you like a little bit about that 
Yeah, it's on it's on Lulu.com. That's where I that's where I want to put it out right now. It's the publishing house there, and I I, uh, I I do all my publishing through them. I have a bunch of other stuff out on there as well. Awesome. Uh, from just publishing screenplays I've written over the years, because I love to write a lot of screenplays that I've written that I've written just for myself. I've published because it's fun to share the stories with other people. They're, they're not expensive. They're hardback. I design all my own covers, you know, so the artistic side of it is also, you know, comes from me as well on, on, on the on the cover artwork and everything. And and, you know, and, and I'm not saying you're not going to find a couple of grammatical errors, you know, throughout <laughs> it, possibly, but n- nothing startling. Trust me. But there might be a couple. But I but like I say, only God is perfect and he created man. So what can we say about him? There you go. Uh, <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Well, yeah, I think it's good that you don't go too, you know, I don't know. Method about it, you know, little Jared Leto sending uh, dead rats to your stars or anything like that? We've talked about yeah, I that. Mean, I don't. I mean, that could be funny. I mean, I, I wouldn't do it because of a character thing. I might, I might, I might <laughs> do something like that just because I thought it was funny. But it wouldn't be a real dead rat. It would be like you know one of those fake dead rats for movies. I have one here at the house. I, I produced a film uh, uh, more recently in Mississippi that I wrote uh, called uh, Deadly Justice. It's coming out soon. Uh, with myself, Brian Krause, Jason London, uh, uh, Kelly Sullivan, great cast, oh, and nice. uh, uh, yeah, it's gonna it's gonna be a fun film. And uh, and we had a dead rat scene in that, and I got to order the dead rat from the dead rat people myself. Nice. I got to pick out the exact dead rat, had a little rib cage showing and everything. I was like, that is my rat, man. <laughs> Taking that home. So, you should mail so it to Jason London. It, <laughs> it, 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 the, the dead rat gets gets broken out every now and then to, uh, to scare somebody. Uh, you know. So, I think that uh, it's I, I, yeah. a fake dead rat, but not a real dead rat. But, That's great. Uh, but, <laughs> but as far as yeah, but as far as the book goes, it, it's it's a very it's very interesting because the, the, his philosophy is something that's it's it's very Buddhistic and it, and it's it separates the the idea of self from the true self. You could kind of say basically he says that uh, you know he, he taught us that, that that the personality is something that's not a it's not a fixed immovable object. It's something that, that gets programmed over years of our experience in our lives, our traumas, or what we're taught, uh, how we're brought up, what economic strata we're in, what race we are, all this, all those, all the package that comes together that eventually pre-programs an identity for somebody that when you're acting, you want to strip clean and be as bare bones as possible mm-hmm. about your own personality so that you're not drawing on yourself and or leaning on crutches of your own uh, you you know, identifying factors. You can see that in a lot of actors who become successful, they start performing the same character in every single role without really any change except for their wardrobe. And even mm-hmm. that starts to look alike, you know, and not saying they're not doing great performances, but, but, but how do you challenge yourself every single time in some way, shape or form, you know, depending on what it is, of course, you know, you know, I, I never recommend phoning in a, a performance. It's a, I think it's always a bad idea, but, and, but, but also taking risks that may not turn out well because you know you're tired of doing it this way tired of doing it. i did it i did this one lifetime movie where i wanted my character wear glasses but they didn't have glasses that had fake lenses on you know like like gla- you know regular lenses but they so they're like real coke bottle lenses and i couldn't see shit and it was driving me nuts <laughs> and so i'm constantly taking them off and putting them on and taking them off and putting them on and i didn't realize that i was doing that when we filmed it when i saw part of it i was like oh my god that's like i can't even watch this <laughs> So, you know, it's, it's risky. Literally. Taking, but <laughs> have, okay, so, said, it, have you, you ever know. tried the method? Like, yes, have you I ever gone through that? And, and like the Daniel yeah, Day yeah, Lewis walking yeah. around as Bill the Butcher and annoying everyone at yeah. craft service? Yes. <laughs> yeah, I studied with Larry Moss for a while in LA. Uh, it went in the early 90s. Uh, for a few years, and I did a couple of dramatic roles during that time period. Uh, one, one of them was my son Johnny with with uh, Rick Schroeder and Michelle Lee, and and uh, and then the other one was a Life Force Experiment with uh, Donald Sutherland, and uh, and they were real heavy, heavy dramatic roles. And I had never been I had I had been studying since I was 11 years old, but the teachers I studied with. Uh, really didn't use the method because they were they were teaching teen they were teaching young adults anyway. So mm-hmm. I don't know what, why you would want to introduce that kind of uh, ideology to a young actor when they're when you're in such a formative state. But uh, but that said, uh, um, 
I, I, I got into the method in my, in my early, you know, like late teens, like 18, 19 years old, did these couple of movies and, and found that, that, that what I, the performance, for instance, that I did in, I know my first name is Steven, that I got an Emmy nomination for, uh, when I was 15 and was, was one of the most dramatic roles that I'd ever played and still ever played in my life was I, I didn't know anything about the method during that time period and was purely just creating it from from my own, you know, my, my own space, believing myself to be the character. Mm -hmm. And that's all I needed. And I found that when I was trying to drum up all this stuff for these other roles and everything, it made it far more difficult for me personally to get to, to drum to, to, to bring out the emotion because I don't like to think about the pain and trauma of my past. I don't know about anybody else, but it's not something that I like to, you know, go and dig up, you know, uh, and uh, and use to to generate emotion for a scene that has nothing to do with that as well. You know, yeah, if, that's the scene, be, if, if the uh, scene is, is, is I'm crying because I lost my job and in order to generate tears because I lost my job, I'm thinking about, you know, that time that my mother got run over by a car in front of me or something. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, that's yeah, it's a very. You know, uh, yeah, now you're not, overreacting to yeah, losing your job. Yeah. <laughs> it's a little too much. Could you rein it in? Just, you know, yeah. That's just, no, it so makes it's, sense. No, it's yeah, true it's though. Cool. I mean, and and I mean that's why I think this book is interesting because it kind of teaches you that. Uh, what, what really? What is the main focus of this book? I should ask. Because yeah, you kind the, the main focus is is on introducing uh, introducing the reader to the concept that they aren't the personality that, that they're behaving with every day, that it's, that that's the, that like a suit or, or a costume or anything else that you can put on a mask, this, that, the other, it can be dropped. And, and kind of in, in, in a sort of a scientifically proven way, you could say that, 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 that it is, it is a truth that, that personality is a totally fictional creation of the mind uh, you know, for for survival purposes, but for other reasons too, because otherwise an actor wouldn't be able to to put on a character that has a different accent, a different cadence, a different physical you know w uh, you know walk or this that or all, whatever the case may be. If personality was some fixed thing, if it was mm -hmm. if it was just something that we have that we can't escape from. Right. You know, you wouldn't be able to drop it and put on another personality for performative purposes or for any other reason. You, it'd be impossible. And you find that some people are so embedded in their own personalities, they're incapable of do. That's why they get that's why they could sit back and go, wow, it's amazing how that person can act like this when they really sound like that. Like when you hear some Australian actor doing a Southern accent, you're like, my God, he went from that. It's, you know, whatever the case may be, it's, it, it, it's, uh, it, to somebody who doesn't have the capacity to let go of themselves and embody uh, another, uh, another idea of self that isn't even true to them at all, but they can, they can make it seem true. Mm -hmm. That's, you know, in, in old times, that was kind of a magical act. It was a, it was a spiritual kind of, of act. The, 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 uh, the performances that were done in ancient Greece and Rome and all of that, the way that the, the actors, you know, thought of it, thought of it as they were as they were doing the Commedia dell'arte and the mask mm -hmm. performances and things like that. They were embodying these emotional right. states and these spiritual states and these stories that had deeper meaning and whatnot. That's uh, some of that is touched on in the book. But the main thing is, is to get to just grasp the loose idea that that we may we may be able to step away from the the the, the this pre pre program predisposed condition that 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 we all can t tend to find ourselves in on the daily with how reactionary we are to life. You know, do we, re do we always react the same way? Are we on automatic pilot for the most part? By the time we get to work, do we even remember the journey there? Or are we mm -hmm. on such automatic pilot that we don't even know how we got there? We just arrived and sat down at our desks and then, then you're back in traffic on the way home. Is on the way home, are you doing anything to expand your mind or do something that might change your way of thinking or behaving or, you know, it, it kind of the book kind of touches on the fact that life can become scripted for us. Yeah. You know, no. and when life is scripted for us, we know what our job is. We know where we have to go every day. We know the other characters we're going to be coming into contact with. We know all of these things and it becomes scripted. And therefore we go ab about our journey in life. But but the one thing that we can keep 100 percent creative control over is our personal character, you know. Hmm. 
I like it, man. Well, yeah, thank you for. I really appreciate you calling in. Um, we can check out the book at yeah, Lulu.com, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. right? Thanks, thanks for letting me uh, spill the beans in yeah. such a detailed fashion. I no, absolutely. I'm would, fascinated. We, we want to have you in studio, and I hope you'll come. And again, the book is uh, creating a character for the stage or life. Oh, and real quick question. Um, Hulk Hogan gave a toast at your wedding, I heard. <laughs> Did he rip his shirt off after? Oh, I so. wish he would have. I would have. Oh. I would have taken that shirt that, uh, right back to the honeymoon suite. <laughs> Frank, like that, it was uh, epic. He gave me. You know, some people were like, "Oh, I can't believe he went and like you know show ponied at your at your wedding or whatever." And I was like, "What are you talking about?" He gave me the most props that you could ever give anybody. It was the nicest speech ever. He, I mean, I was like, <laughs> it made me seem like the man. Did you not hear what he said, or did you just see him inside of a box on TV? Yeah, I don't know. That's oh, so cool. How do you not show pony? if you're a professional wrestler yeah that's, that's iconic it's your job. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. Your job i'd be like yeah you're hulk hogan do whatever you, you want you have to do that yeah Absolutely. it's your wedding now <laughs> you can ddt my wife <laughs> <laughs> well anyway thank you so much for calling in again check out you the bet. book and we hope to have you in studio and soon I'll, I'll, I'll definitely come up there and get in studio with you man i got Hell some yeah. stuff going on in texas uh, this year very I'll cool let's do it appreciate it my friend have a great rest of your day appreciate it cheers See you, man. you too later ali have you ever done any acting a very Hello. small amount. I'm, yeah, I'm not, I mean, I can play me. That's pretty much it. <laughs> All of this method stuff is so weird. I feel like the, do you feel like the actors must make fun of the method people too? Like, what's well, there's a great story right? with uh, RoboCop. Oh, oh the, the yeah. Oreo store? Yeah, Which was shot here, yes. by the way. It was shot here. Oh, yeah, a lot and, of it. And yeah, and RoboCop, uh, the guy playing him, Peter Weller, was doing it method and the other guy goes oh f shut the fuck up and just started laughing at him that's the proper response yeah. i feel like it's so ridiculous <laughs> right, because he's like and then peter weller was so like damaged by it he basically quit acting after that movie. <laughs> <laughs> like but so, it is like wow. it's like nobody wants you to yeah. you gotta be you seriously can't stay in robot character you're gonna lose it yeah you ha you can't just go in and out of that like that's what acting is if you're an actor you should be able to go in and out of the character you shouldn't have to stay yeah, yeah he called himself robot. robo <laughs> It's like it Robo amazing. wants a cookie. It's, like, it's so great that one like taste of reality knocked him out of it. Like, yeah. what is wrong with you? He's like, yeah. all right, I quit. <laughs> Can't. Right. I forget the Miguel Ferrer. I think is his name. I forget the name, the actor's name. But yeah, it was just somebody who had been in Hollywood. whose dad was a producer, and this was like one of his first bigger movies. He's also the bad guy in Blank Check, uh, and he was just hey. like, I'm not doing this with you. No. <laughs> this is ridiculous. <laughs> Even, well, even the Oreo story. So it was, uh, it was like the armorer with the, you know, his prop guns and whatnot. He was up there and he's, he had a little packet of, of Oreos and he goes, Robo wants a Oreo. The guy goes, uh, Robo can't have an Oreo, but Peter can have an Oreo. He goes, Robo needs an Oreo. Oh, there's that. <laughs> and he stepped over cause they're doing that. He was in like a warehouse. So he's up on the, on the third floor in this open warehouse and he goes, Robo wants an Oreo. Oh my god! And they, they call up to the guy and they go, "Hey, could you give him an Oreo?" And he, "Do you have any Oreos?" And he goes, <laughs> and eats them all. And he goes, "Nope, don't have any Oreos." I love so this every guy. day after that. He had to have a, his own personal Robo Oreos. Uh, not only is he in character, but he has to call himself <laughs> by the third person. Yes, that's insane. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, he's just making it so much worse that way. It's childish. Uh, but that movie's so good, though. We also played William S. Burroughs in the Naked Lunch. It's like, were you on heroin the whole time? Right. And then you were withdrawing, watching your typewriter turn into a bug. <laughs> like, did William need the heroin? Yeah. How far did you go into this, Peter? He's like, yes. Exactly. Well, remember when that used to be a thing for actors if they got caught like as a pedophile or like when Winona Ryder got caught stealing? It was always like, I'm doing research for a character. <laughs> yeah. oh, that used to be a big thing. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Oh, I like, love this isn't me. I'm just method. Yes. Yeah. I love Pete Townsend, who's a musician, going yeah. like, Well, I'm just doing research for a book. Oh, yeah, on mm. kitty porn. Right. <laughs> It's a weird book. <laughs> well, yeah, what's your book about, Pete? Strange passion you have there. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's not weird. I'm just simply writing a book. Yes. Are you? Because that, that's it's called a magazine. I'm an artiste. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, show us the outline for what you have so far. Yeah. We'll probably solve some crimes. Yeah, exactly. Oh, you can't. It's on a hard drive I've gotten rid of. <laughs> it's just the cover of the Nirvana album. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's like, it's all I have. Zoomed in. <laughs> just, oh. I just, I hate, like, and I like Daniel Day-Lewis, but I just hate the fact, like, he sent his voice of Abraham Lincoln to Steven Spielberg in, like, a box with a tape in it, and it's, like, wrapped like a gift. Oh, goodness. And then like, it's just, you're welcome. Yeah, you're welcome. I because, bestow you with my talent. Yeah, and it's just this is the voice, and it's just a voice. 
It's like a high pitched uh, wiggly voice. It's like, oh, I'm Abraham Lincoln. Which, right, that's the one like, part that okay. anyone can do, probably. There's a million people who could do that voice, I would imagine. Voice over people. Yeah, you just have to make up Lincoln. Yeah. Nobody's right. going to tell you you're Nobody wrong. <laughs> it's a great point. There's, There's no not proof. a recording. <laughs> do whatever you want. Yeah, you have to be as like, you basically have to go through, uh, uh, yes, uh, four score. And then be like, my wife is nuts. <laughs> she is crazy. Probably has nothing to do with the fact that I gave her syphilis. And then the next part is, ow. Oh. <laughs> ow. Wait, who's that? Because when you got shot with a bullet at close range, then it took like nine days to bleed out. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's the same. Time. That's the same with people getting all upset when someone doesn't win the award for their performance. Yeah. It's like, what, who? they already got paid. They get more roles. They're doing their <laughs> thing as an actor. What does it matter Still if win. you get a trophy? Yeah, you won in life. That's it. What yeah, more do you need? You're in the crowd and you're rich. Yeah. You're wearing either a tuxedo or a dress or some stupid mix of both that, was, that cost more than most people will make in a lifetime. Yeah. Yep. You should just be okay. And you're leaving no. and everyone's just throwing free stuff at you. Like the, yeah. they want the hand, picture the, the taken. Bags. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like it's like the thousand dollar gift bags for every single celebrity that goes. Oh, They're already oh. ripped. Yep. Rich, man. They already have the money. They can get it. And then they complain. They're like, but we have to pay taxes on those gifts. <laughs> it's like, poor thing. <laughs> yeah, then leave them at the table. <laughs> yeah, give them to a you know, tent encampment outside. <laughs> yeah. yeah, give them, you know, the starving people that you just live under through. a sheet. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that they had to power wash away so you could put your red carpet down. Yeah, you know the homeless people you use to check your Coke for fentanyl? <laughs> yeah, the one of those people. Yeah. <laughs> like, try. Test this out. <laughs> yeah. Try this. Ah, oh, we're not doing this tonight, son. <laughs> it just killed this man. <sighs> so yeah, it's it's unreal. It is a very self-important job, though. I mean, comedians are kind of the same. People who think you know we're the modern day philosophers. We're the only ones who tell the truth today. Mm -hmm. It's just all so self-important. Truth teller is nuts to me, though. When you're on stage and being that character, it's like you should do jokes. Yeah. We enjoy those. We've had enough truth for the day. We like to laugh. We're good. Yeah. Yeah. When somebody just turns it into like pontificating and ramblings about stuff, you're like, I don't, what are you doing? Yeah. This is not what anyone came for. It's just like be, half the Netflix comedians. Yeah. I just be funny. Yeah. Yeah. It mm. needs like a real heaviness to it. You're right. Like that's what they look for. I think on Netflix now you need like a message and some real heavy, you know, subject matter. Rape is always popular. Yeah, what's up with that? You can throw in a rape. That's always great in comedy for some reason. Yeah, there's and it's it's good if it's happened several times. Yeah. Mm. For some reason. You might get several specials out of that. <laughs> <laughs> can only hope. It's me. It's his music. <laughs> well, before we get into the next next part, which will be off of that, um, not the, the stand up part. Um yeah. uh I do want to talk about something. What do you what is, what is it? I am wearing elegant underwear. Oh, me too, dude. It's right. It's made by Sierra Whiskey Company, mm -hmm. which is the only kind of alcohol I touch. Oh, this kind. The one that touches <laughs> my... They sent, they sent us uh, hoodies. Yeah, they're the oh, most comfortable dude. thing. Ooh. You don't even know how soft this thing is. It's just, you feel it. It's at undertack.com and you can use promo code NORMAL20. Where I got sweatpants and hoodies. And socks? And socks. I'm wearing the socks right now. I haven't tried on the socks yet. These they're they're just, like hiking socks. These are the ankle socks, and they got ones that go up high. Yeah. This one's, I just wear in short shoes, so I could. But they're very comfy. Like, I, I, have, uh, I have feet I don't like. Anyway, <laughs> Undertack isn't your typical men's boxers. Mm -mm. They're made with a Modal. Is that right? Modal, yeah. I Modal. think. Yeah. Yeah. Think of uh, some kind of space age. Get magic. cotton, but fifty percent better, and fifty percent more moisture wicking, which is something I need. We love to and wick. antibacterial, and it's way softer. Oh yeah. Mm. Is the hoodie made out of the Modal? Because I could feel it, dude. I don't know what they're made out it's of. Amazing. I put that on and I fell asleep for half a day. It's like a warm hug. The it, kisses of angels. It's, it's like, like being in exactly. mother's womb. And you can have that too. <laughs> Don't that you could want be that? You. That <laughs> yeah. could be you right Don't, now. Yeah, Don't, I want that. Go visit <laughs> undertech.com. I'm just saying you're comfortable. Like Promo a, code. Right. Promo 20. But honestly, yeah. I love this company. I cannot recommend it more. It's 20% off. Go to Undertech. It's the most comfortable underwear I've ever worn. And For real. And they their yeah. clothes, and it's the best. Yeah. And it has this great pocket, so you don't leak all day. Yeah, you can keep stuff <laughs> in there. Yeah, you're not like an old Buick. Yeah. Wait, is the pocket for stuff or is it for leaking? No, I don't know what it's. Well, no, see, it's like, most, it, you, know, you know how most flies open mm -hmm. you know, vertically. Like, like vertical. A, 
I yeah. see. This one, this, is a, this one's like a, a a duck. It's up top. Like it's like a little kangaroo for your naughty. Nice. It's like a little Aww. Joey pouch. Yeah. 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 And then you it's get very nice, innovative. Yeah, nice. you put your goods in there, mm -hmm. and then if it and it's made out of a fabric that wicks. Us so. ladies don't have to deal with these man problems. I know. Thank God. <laughs> I know. You I don't did, have to though. tuck my stuff into a pocket. Yeah. Yeah. No it really way. sucks. My you, stuff is a pocket. Yep. Oh right. Exactly. Sorry. We That's can true, keep yeah. stuff in it if yeah, we need to. Exactly. Any woman who's have a baby leaks. Oh yeah. Oh, mm -hmm. it's a thing. I can confirm that. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. I know. I'm just looking at you, you're an old Fleetwood in the garage. Yeah. Leaking. Yep. I know. Just all. That's why you sit on a dowel. So anyway. <laughs> um, <laughs> I wonder what that's going to lead into. Oh, man. Could you imagine a Modal a bra? I bet that would be comfortable. <laughs> oh, man. That could be for you, but they yeah. don't like it yet. Well, Leaking. Think about it. Get on that. It's an idea. Make a maternity bra for that. Get on it. Yeah. Wick away the moisture. Wick away all that, all that extra milk. You got to do all that. Go flap it away. Yep. All the extra milk. <laughs> Is that what you said? Yeah. yeah. I think they also sweat. Well, that's no, it. no. No, there's no. They don't. There's no such yeah. thing as Boops, sweat. There's if they're no. big enough, but not, I guess not me. Oh. oh that's I guess you don't have terrible to say. Sorry. I do. Yeah. I, <laughs> I titty sweat like I just, just ran a marathon. Just a lake down there. <laughs> Two like Olympic <laughs> swimming pools. Swear. Yeah, I just right next to each other. <laughs> Why did you build a second one? Uh, I don't know. One short walk to my car, and it's like a 5K. <laughs> just, oh, I'm like, boy, I wish I had something to wick this titty sweat. Mm. <laughs> so much information. <laughs> would you like to feel? Really. All right, so. <laughs> would, would you like a taste? Would you like underneath mm. my titty? Um, speaking of hilarious, uh, Dylan Mulvaney, who has not graced us enough with uh, her presence... Uh, a clip of Mulvaney attempting stand-up uh, has now resurfaced uh, from January in Salt Lake City, which I'm sure is the exact city that wanted that. Mm. Uh, let's take a gander. <laughs> I, would be, I would feel like I was a part of something bigger than this. <laughs> that was a double entendre. Look at me doing stand-up. <laughs> the conservative men are just pissed that I can beat them in beer pong. <laughs> And the conservative women are pissed that their kids are calling me mother in all of my Instagram <laughs> Dave, are you upset that she stole your, your bit? Set? My yeah. whole bit. Well, Where you I, go, Pah. Yeah, yeah right you go, Heidi. I always say, I look slap. at me try stand up, and I slap my bottom <laughs> under my dress. And skip around the <laughs> yeah. stage. Yeah. Yeah. But wait. Uh, that's how you let people know you're confident and know what you're doing. Mm. Yep. That's what I learned when my teacher, uh, my stand-up teacher, coach, uh, molested me. <laughs> so those don't exist. That was you should have been your first clue. <laughs> that was yeah. It's not a real job. Yep. Yeah, she says. Uh, yeah. Uh, oh, she... Lord, kids calling. Oh, God, I just don't care. Who is calling I... her mother online? Yeah, I don't even know, know what she's talking that's about. That's a that's a common thing now for like it's like gay lingo where it's like like Lady Gaga is mother and like. Women that they look up to or something is mother. Don't talk about Mother like, Gaga like that. It's, it's <laughs> like Queen Gaga. Bee. I've never. Yeah, yeah. That. Like okay. Beyonce would be. Thing. Yeah, she's she's mother. Yeah. It's a it's queen. A wow. Weird. It's very strange. If you're gonna change your gender, why don't you change your last name? It's a weird last name. Is that uh, Mulvaney? Uh, is that uh, Mother Alley? Well, dude. same with the first name. I guess that could be either or. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Dylan. I guess could. Sw it, there are people radio. that name their daughter Dylan. That's fine. It is great, though, that every true, yeah. punchline is basically her slapping her ass. Or it's like a statement. And then like, ah! Yeah. <laughs> there's no jokes. It's like everything do. she does, there's no point. <laughs> and then no one wants it oh. when it's done. <laughs> well, it's true. Yeah. Just ask Doritos. She's just better at tweeting. <laughs> <laughs> I guess why I showed that is to get into this part. Okay. Oh. The Just for Laughs Festival uh, was canceled this year. The organizers of Canada's well-regarded Just for Laughs Festival, a major gathering in Montreal where a number of comics have been discovered, like all of them, have canceled this year's event and filed for bankruptcy. Multiple reports have said 70% of the staff has also been let go as a result, uh, which has been blamed on COVID plus rising inflation. What? Well, yeah, I don't doubt that. In a statement given Tuesday, the company said... Uh, the board of directors, uh, after having exclusively considered all available alternatives, came to the conclusion that, I should say this was uh, other Thursday because this is airing Friday, so a week ago, uh, the financial situation of the organization left no other choice 
than to initiate formal uh, restructuring proceedings. So wait, is it that they don't have the money or they don't, or it's COVID? Is it- I, here's the thing. I think it's good for young comics. Have you done it? I did. I did it. New Faces 2013 or 14, a while ago. Yeah, so you know how it's uh, a circle jerk, pompous, yeah. uh, awful experience. Really? And no one gets discovered there anymore. I love that they said every comic has you know, been discovered. People get discovered on TikTok now, pretty much. It's not oh. just for laughs anymore. Yeah, I was there with Pantelis and Mike Ward, and we were at a press junket, and I hadn't been there yet because I had a DUI, so I had to wait till 2019. Aww. <laughs> and uh, they asked me what I thought of but it. you couldn't get in the country correct I was yeah they were home. very strict Damn. about that kind of thing yeah, i was banned from canada and i couldn't even cross the border to go do work i mean i mean i may have but let's not talk about it and paid in cash <laughs> um but the uh, part of it is i couldn't do the festival though yeah and in 2019 we were asked it was me mike ward and i'm sure they have a tape of it and pantelis and they were like a press <laughs> He was like, what do you think of the festival? And I was like, oh, I think it's the most elitist circle jerk I've ever been a part of. And it just killed. And it was like, <laughs> that's like, amazing. You're not invited again. Yeah, <laughs> they cut the mic. Well, everything about it, though, was people looking over you yes. and talking to you and everybody trying to be self-important. It was the it was everything that I hate about Hollywood that was jammed into Canada. And I think it sucks because a lot of these venues are great. I think it's great for a lot of comics. I think... There are benefits to it, but that was the year that Shane Gills got discovered as well. Oh, uh, I, I didn't know he got well. discovered at it. Like, th- that's where Lauren Michaels saw him? That's where he had the set that got him SNL. Okay. okay. We had seen him, I, I believe, but that was the, there was 20 very woke carbon copies of each other and then him. Gotcha. So I was, and we were both on Compound Media at the time, and like we were at that show. So, the, but the whole festival I had never seen, and it's like you had huge names there. I mean, they were everywhere, but at the same time, it was just, it was almost tragic of like the the level of insecurity that had just manifested hmm. into the, and like the gatekeeper at the time uh, was that one dipshit who wore a fedora all the yeah, time. Yeah, um, Jeff Singer. Yeah, who ended yeah. up getting in trouble for sexual assault and all that. Yeah. Yeah, which I couldn't have been happier because I could have told you he was a knob <laughs> from the day I met him. And like the people who were also part of it i liked a lot of the people that helped book but he was another gatekeeper and it was good to just see something that has all these gatekeepers start to go away like Mm -hmm. i want it to be rebuilt but i think it has the potential to grow in like the right way yeah i think it can be rebuilt can be funded i think it should be funded i think the idea of a comedy festival is great but i think that something that gets rid of these gatekeepers I don't know. I think it's good that it's it went away. I feel bad for the people with the jobs, right? But I hope yeah. that it comes back for them. I always talk about that because we see that in a lot of different areas too. Like uh, a lot of magazines and and uh, uh, article websites are losing staff. They have to lay them all off. Uh, major studios are laying people off constantly. Video we're seeing in the video game space as well. Uh, I, I feel bad for those people because they're not the ones usually making the bad decisions that get them into that position. Yep. Yeah. It's usually the higher ups that have no responsibility and they go, oh, well, you know, it was a, it was a tough year. Yeah. Hired a hundred people. It's also strange that, you know, the festival happens once a year, although there's like some small offshoots of it, but a guy like Jeff Singer who books the festival as a full-time job, how is that a job that exists? <laughs> like, how do you get paid $365 a year? I mean, days a year to book a festival that basically happens over one month. And you travel all around the country. It and then you, costs so much money to yeah. yeah discover these people. Yeah, and you hold these auditions in various clubs where these kids and these other people have to pay to hopefully have a dream come true to get in front of a guy who's not going to give you any real advice because he's never been on a stand-up mm-hmm. stage. Yeah, and he's basically going off of a lot of recommendations too. It's, it's, you know, for the most part, like you said, all these carbon copies of each other that get put on stage, those names are out there. It's like the Dylan Mulvaney thing. Like she is going to continue to be so famous regardless of if she's talented or not. Cause her name is just out there. Well, yeah, she's a, she's public and for what, you know, I guess a group likes her, but whatever it is, it, it's on that audience. Yeah. It found an audience. Yeah. So they'll just ride that out until, you know, and they do that with names of comics too. Like there's not a lot of people that you see that you're surprised about in that festival. It's like, oh, we've already heard about this person. We've heard about this person. There's not someone that shocks you, which you were saying though, Shane Gillis was one of them. So occasionally it still probably happens. Yeah. And I mean, and that was, you know, five years ago now. And I haven't heard of giant breaks, you know, that people have had, you know, in, that festival in a very long time. And and like I said, overall, I think it is a positive thing. 
But these people are given so much power and, and watching it happen, it was agents and managers that showed up to look for people. Yeah. Um, and that always, it's always just so phony when you deal with any one of them. And it, it's just disheartening about a business that's supposed to be about art and comedy. And you have to deal with people who they're just swinging their dicks for a lack of a better word and trying to convince you of their importance. And I, you know, I'm just sitting there like, I remember I just sat at a table with Rich Voss for an hour and a half and talked. And I was like, I just wanted to have a conversation with somebody. Yeah. There's no reason to like care. Yeah. <laughs> and it, it, it just didn't, there was nothing about it that I found that incredible. And I think that's the problem is so much of these festivals have lost their luster. Now others have popped up that I'm sure are amazing. But I did um like the HBO festival in Vegas in 2005, I think it was. It was the version of the Aspen Comedy Festival. Okay. And it was the best unknown club comics in America. And at that time it was like Lavelle Crawford and Dan Cummings and I believe Chad Daniels and a few other people. And it's like, oh, this is great. You yeah. Know, we were all in this group, Mike Loftus. And uh, it was this huge festival. Like Ellen was there and Seinfeld and like all the big names at the time. And we were just thrown into like random rooms. We were thrown into a tent on the strip. <laughs> Wow. Like, it was it was horrible. Yeah. <laughs> horrible. <laughs> They're like, let's make this job that's already really hard, as, but like even harder, as hard as we can possibly like make it. Like a boot camp? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And they, and they always want to make sure they can identify and box you into exactly what they are, yeah. what you are, so they can sell you with something else that already exists. They don't want to go, oh, what's your unique story? They just want to go, oh, you're like this, so yeah. I can market you because it's already the... Nobody's looking for originality at these things. Nobody's really t doing anything edgy or a reverend or new they're at least if they are they're not being looked for yeah if you were to do a festival because you started that saying like there's this other festival that i was like oh, okay so a good one and then it turned out to not be a good one either so what would you do if you had the reins or the decision making on, on a festival like that i would bring on people based solely on talent i would not i would if you had to charge people i would do a way where it's being funded like this was mm -hmm. by companies that want to televise it and want to find sponsors and want to be a part of it i wouldn't charge every comic on earth a submission fee so you can fatten the wallet of whoever's putting the festival on mm -hmm. um which look some have to do if they're very independently created and i understand that yeah but as something that's enormous like this it yeah. shouldn't exist like that well, that's the other thing about the festival, you know, the Montreal Comedy Festival, a lot of the big acts obviously get paid well, but the the new faces don't really get paid. So I don't know how they're losing money hand over fist. It's bizarre. They're not paying out a lot. No. And it's it it's just convincing people of how big it is and how important it is the yeah. last few years. And that was a lot of Jeff's job was going from town to town and club to club and being like, I have the key to success. <laughs> Can I touch your tits? <laughs> Nothing says success like a fedora. Yeah. Oh, my God. <laughs> the meetings I did get after that, though, it's exactly what you said. Even then, um, I went in with ideas for sitcoms and stuff. And I was like, these are the things that are unique about me. I you know, studied abroad in school. There were funny things that happened. I had a foster sister from Cambodia. And they were like, what, what are you talking about? Do you have any ideas about like dating? And I was like, yeah, but there's already a million shows about dating. They're like, yeah, there's a million shows about lawyers. And those are all successful so they're not looking for anything original no. at all. It's yeah, it's disappointing. And it's very hard to be creative and deal with that element. Yeah. And it's like to the sad part is to an extent they're right. Yeah. But they also don't try anything. And then when it works, they just don't stop doing it. Yeah. yeah. When you find this little, this little flash of genius and then it's just milk. They always take the wrong lesson from it. They'll take oh, yeah. something that's successful and go, oh, well, what's that? And then it must be. Because of something else that, like, um, the success of The Joker came out. I, I always just go back to pop culture because that's what I know. Uh, the Joker was crazy successful because it was super low budget. And the media kind of blew it all into this firestorm and made it a big success. And Joaquin. And I, I mean, he's a great actor. It's a draw. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So those, it, it's a, he's a great actor. The director is really great. God, Philip. Um, uh, the story was interesting. Was that low budget? Yeah. It, compared. It was I mean, like, yeah, 80, like relatively. 80 million or something like that. Okay. Um, compared to like 200 million. All these superhero Marvel movies, movies right? or whatever. Yeah. So of, of course they're not going to take the, the aspect going, okay, we get a good, good director, really good actor. Let's just let them be free. Cause that's kind of what they did. They were like, what is this Joker movie? Whatever. Just give them like $80 million. Make them do the thing. And it turned out to be a success. So they're going to go, okay, 
let's just make all of these little superheroes or villains like Madam Web into big movies. And uh, that's going to be, the, that's the magic success. It is not. That is not the success. It's talented people that have passion for the stories that they're trying to tell. Yeah. But, yeah it's the same thing with that. Is uh, they'll, t- they'll take the wrong lessons. Yeah. And I think when they hit it, they're getting lucky a lot of times. Because I know in my group in Montreal, right. Andrew yeah. Schultz was one of the big people and he didn't get anything from it. And he famously talks about it because he was like, Netflix didn't want me, like no one was interested. And so that's when he started putting all his stuff out, basically on YouTube. And I guess it was just YouTube at the time. And he just blew up himself. And so, he, he was a festival guy. We were talking about Matt McClowry earlier and they were in tons of festivals together yep. where they'd both place like first and second next to each other and you'd never, wow. it's like, but then third got something. Yep. You know, and they were doing this for years. Well, and that was the thing too. I remember in festivals, it happened a lot. They already kind of had picked who was going to do something after the festival, I think. But like in my new faces, I remember everyone did okay because the crowd's not real. You know, their agents sitting with mm-hmm. an iPad taking notes and a lot of speak French too. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's going to be rough. It's so rough. You just see the light shining in people's mm. faces, but the one person on the showcase that bombed so hard already had a lot of heat and was like the only person to get anything out of the festival. So we're like, oh. the, I mean, the festival part doesn't even matter. They knew who they wanted, right. you know? So I think Sundance is the same way. The, in the movie field is uh, they bring in, a, it used to be where they would, bring in young filmmakers that are passionate about their thing. They'd make movies and they'd show it there. And then that's where they would get purchased. Well, now it works. And that's also a a festival that's kind of breaking down is now it works where they, they've already purchased the movies. It's already got hype. It's already got a big name. And these are, it's just a showcase really. Yeah. That's all it is. Yeah. Um, I think what you were saying is like the, the aspect of being on TikTok or some kind of on, on the internet, putting your stuff on YouTube, that's kind of democratized, the whole thing, you don't need the middleman. You don't need the festival or that guy going around uh, America and, and hawking his crap to try to get you to go to his festival because it's like, why do I need to do this? Yeah. Just go on YouTube and post my stuff there. And then, uh, you know, it's meritocracy. Well, and it's hard because it's gatekeeper to gatekeeper to gatekeeper and what <laughs> right. goes out there. Then you're dealing with algorithms. But I mean, at least it feels like there's more of a fighting chance mm-hmm. yeah. convincing one person at that exact time. And it's like you said, you know the person they're always going to be building up yeah they're supposed to make it no matter what yeah they're going to get the opportunities no matter what yeah whether they make it or not is different but then yeah the other people who figured out the other way to do it and that is like a meritocracy but it also can be the opposite because you have these people who know how to make three minute clips that are amazing just got that yeah and then you go out and see like an hour and you're like good lord what is (laughs) this this is terrible (laughs) yeah well, and then you, and you also see the name of them though, and then the picture, and you're like, "Why did you think this would be good?" Right. Like you went to see a character. Yeah. Like, and not like a character, like like it's not even like Larry the Cable Guy where they had comedy chops. Yeah. You just went and saw this guy who had a TikTok. That's usually like a one minute supercut clip. Yeah. Very different format. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, you can't see them do something all the way through and be entertained. They need to chop it up and edit it. Right. No, and yeah, the idea of them putting out... And us even watching something that's like five minutes is somehow absurd. Yeah. But then you'll go watch them do an hour in a club that you drove to. <laughs> like, why don't you give something more than 10 minutes at home and see if you like the person and who they really are? Test it out. The sad thing is, though, those people still stay successful because even if the show stunk, they have so much merch at the end that people are still like, oh, I'll buy their merch and post oh, yeah. a picture of me on TikTok with them. And it still is a success. Oh, yeah. They don't care. I mean, that's the problem is, uh, you know, star efforts. It's like they just come back. Yeah. They just want to see the person. Yeah. Which is great. I mean, good. You found the fan base. But then when you look at it as an artist, you're watching it and just going, why... Why did I why did I do this? Why did anybody do this? Right. <laughs> why is this a thing? It's like I get why people find you amusing, but why does it have to why is it stand up? Can't you make a movie? Why do you always have to fall back into my field? Why does every <laughs> career fail? And then you're like, and now I'm doing stand up. That's always the case. <laughs> That's what I chose as a live 
<laughs> goal. Yeah. It's so sad. Yeah, that's uh, like during all the strikes, during the writer strikes and actor strikes, you're just waiting for the line to come in of all the actors and uh, writers just getting their five minutes. Oh, you're just waiting for all your... Auditions. Al Franken's out there? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, what? I'm following Al Franken. <laughs> yeah. You're like, I was just, uh, yeah, you're just waiting for all your dates to get bumped by people who haven't done stand up and have been around since the 80s. Exactly. <laughs> That's the worst. It really is. That's yeah. sad. And then it's not g g the numbers of ones that I've met, too, where they're like, yeah, no, I'm really taking it seriously. And then you see them on stage and you're like, I hate you. Yeah. I hate everything you're doing. Like, are you? Yeah. Mm hmm. Yeah, how seriously can you possibly take me? You're just trying to bide your time until something else comes along. Right. Well, it's you just can't make money right now, and you're confused. You're like, I don't understand. I just... Al Franken, though, is honestly taking it as a like stage for politics again, I feel like. Because there of was course. an instance where he was on stage at the Comedy Cellar in New York, and the place was flooding. Like it was literally flooding. And so they were lighting him and he was like, I I'm not at 20 minutes. And they're like, dude, we're evacuating. You gotta go off stage. He's water. He's worse than a comic, like running the light. He's like, oh. I got stuff to say. It's yes. like, you're at a comedy <laughs> club. You're about to go under. I reclaim my time. Reclaim my time, please. This is important. You're like, it's, it's, this is why Michael O'Donohue used to throw your typewriter out the window at SNL. <laughs> And I actually, I don't mind. I mean, he's at least an experienced comedian in the sense of was Stuart Smalley, was a comedy writer, wrote sketch. Like That is true. And he goes around and actually puts in his, you know, 20 minutes of work each night trying to work on his act. Yeah. And he's genuinely like, like him or not his politics. It's like he's genuinely has a sense of humor where there's other people who just have never been in that field. And all of a sudden it's like, I'm a stand up now. And you're like, this is uh, like, this is hell. But of course you're going to get booked because you're going to sell tickets because somebody wants to take a picture with you. Yep. Mm -hmm. I remember John Mayer going on stage in, and when you're super successful at your own trade anyways, that's the other thing that's weird when people go into stand up. He was doing, he did like a five minute set and he said something about like, Jessica like, Guys. Simpson being fat. <laughs> <I'm just kidding. laughs> oh my God. Oh my God. I just read her book, by the way. There yeah. is so much bad stuff about him. It's oh, yeah. unreal. I was like, how did he escape getting a, That's a lot of trouble? <laughs> but anyway, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you, but yeah. No, he was telling this, he was basically like, he goes, guys, we have t-shirts. When they get dirty, we don't put them in the wash, right? And they're like, no. He's like, we throw them out. And the girl's like, what? <laughs> it's like, how much money do you think yeah, we just have? throw out your $85 white shirt? Right? It was like, it was like the world you live in, you cannot do stand up. This yeah. is crazy. Don't you guys hate it when you have to go to the Ferrari dealership to pay for the six thousand dollar oil change. You're like, yeah. uh, what? Huh? Like, am I supposed to laugh? Like, yeah, we don't. We okay? Yeah, we relate. <laughs> All right, John. <laughs> My Rolex broke. This is uh. This All right, is guys, terrible. come on. You, you guys, you you know, right? <laughs> it's funny just hearing people in the crowd like, I need my shirt. <laughs> we only own five. We we keep them all. Yeah. I do um, laundry every day. <laughs> do not. Oh, weird. Okay. Man, I've, I guess I've been living some kind of giant good life since my late teens. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's... It, the biggest thing is relatability, and that's when I've watched a lot of them on stage. Then they walk off and they're like, man, that crowd kind of sucks. And it's like, you said nothing. <laughs> you talked about how rich you were for 50 minutes and yeah. people that you know. Yeah. And made fun of anyone who wasn't of your status. <laughs> yeah, like, it's not... That's not killer material. <laughs> no, people kind of hate you for it. It's odd. So strange. Yeah. But you're right. Everyone loves to fall back on it. And yeah, people let them. I mean, people do want to see anyone who's famous. It's like reality stars show up. And I guess that's kind of interesting for people to see. But, you know, a lot it's of people are unhinged. Up. It's not stand up. Yeah. That's the other thing. Like people think being unhinged is just stand up too. If they just go and complain about everything going on, yeah. they think that's going to do it. It's just not. Yeah. yeah. I have immense respect for, for comics. Like you, like anytime Thank we've you. written copy for our show and it's like comedians, Dave and Garrett, I'm like, I'm not a comedian. <laughs> do not consider me a comedian. Cause uh, that takes so much work to, to get to the point where you can call yourself a comedian. Like there's a lot of, of yourself that you have to pour into and, and uh, really think about the way you say words, it, you know, it, and dissect them and the setup and punchline. There's like so much of that 
that that I respect. And it, there's a lot of people that just think that, oh yeah, just go up there and, and be charismatic. And I'm like, that's not really a comedian. Like a comedian is like a freaking ninja with words, you know, like they think about that shit. Writes out their stuff. Yeah. yeah. But then on the flip side too, you have a lot of people who are like, only certain people can do comedy. Not everyone can do comedy. Yeah. It's like, that's overly pretentious too. It's like, anyone can really write and work at comedy. It's just us crazy people that are like, you know, oh, that worked. Will that work in Michigan? Will that oh, also yeah. work in Virginia? Like, I'll dedicate my life to figuring out where people laugh at this stuff. Yeah, yeah and then you kind of slowly realize, oh, it kind of just works everywhere. Yeah. People are, have senses of humor. As people long. are just people, yeah. yeah. As long as nobody stands up and starts screaming that happens occasionally, it pretty much just works. You just get a lunatic in the crowd who'll be, hey, what? I've seen that. Huh? Yeah, <laughs> more and more lately, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and it's just, I mean, it, it. you know, people say that too, like, well, how do you deal with a heckler? It's like, you kind of just, it comes with the territory. Yeah. You're not worried about it. You just go up on stage. Yeah. It's just part of it. And once again, if you have the crowd on your side, you can pretty much take care of a heckler. They'll back you up. Right. Like, if you don't know what you're doing, you're then Kramer, who shouldn't have been <laughs> oh, on. Oh, God. Because Man. he was another one of those people who was like, I'll just do it. And Seinfeld was like... Do it other places, like yeah. around, do open mics. Don't just start saying you're, oh, okay, he did that. Oh, right. Wow. Yeah, he never came back from that no, one. No. No, it's hard. That's, a tu- that's <laughs> the toughest one to come back from. The, the hard R. The hard R. Oh, yeah. yeah. Yep. That, that's never been a good heckler rebuttal. <laughs> no. <laughs> no one's ever thought that it was until then. I don't know anyone who ever had that as a, a you know, in the whatever ready to go what's odd is the stuff he said was actually worse <laughs> like once you got farther in it you're like good yeah, lord continued. Stop. oh no was it just that one remember word? it yeah, i just love that he got yeah. off and said to jeff garland he goes tough room and he's like do you do you not know <laughs> what you've done? done oh my god <laughs> the, the saddest part about that whole debacle with kramer is uh when he went on to the late late night show oh letterman jerry uh like introduced it and was like, Hey, he's coming on. He's going to apologize. And then he, uh, not what's his, what's his real name? Um, Jerry Seinfeld and David Letterman. No, no. Michael, oh, Michael, Michael Richard. uh, Richards. Richards. Right. Yeah. He came up there very like somber and he was going to apologize. And then before he really even said anything, the entire crowd started laughing, laughing. Yeah. They hadn't heard because, of it because they were, like ready for Kramer to do something funny. Oh, he was like trying to have like a serious, no. I'm, I'm apologizing. Yeah. It was just like this weird, I'm like voyeuristically watching him soul, his soul crush oh. in that moment. Cause like they're laughing at him because they see him as this funny Goofy, guy. Yeah. He like severely fucked up and he's trying to apologize for it. And he's got Jerry Seinfeld right Jerry. next to him trying to like, <laughs> be like, hey, my buddy's trying to apologize. It was just so. Uh, and you just have Jerry just being like, he's going to come on and apologize. <laughs> yeah, he's gonna he come has something here. to say. Calling everybody the, the racism. racism. <laughs> 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 and the crowd didn't. What's the deal? Oh, they did not get it. What's they did the not. deal with That's him? That's so funny. I thought you were going to say they started booing immediately. And just no, it was the shot. opposite. That's yeah, why it was so odd. So strange. No, it hadn't quite hit everybody, you know? It's like news when you talk about on stage and you realize no one knows what you're talking about because yeah. you're too ingrained in it. Oh, oh no. <laughs> yeah, the whole place is just like, oh, this what? is great. Uh. Oh, Kramer would never do that. <laughs> you're like, wait, what happened? <laughs> is this a bit? Yeah, this is great. Oh, bit, this right? is real. <laughs> oh. Yeah, and I had met him about a month before and couldn't be happier. Um, <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's right. You have, yeah. This. I forgot about that. Did you have a bad experience with him? Horrible person. Really? Yeah. Oh. And, I mean, I'm sure he's different now. He probably has. I don't know. People haven't been humbled a lot of times. No, he should have been. I feel like he has to be. Maybe. I hope so. It's a worldwide deflation <laughs> of his ego, hopefully. If you're him, you can just be a dick now. There's you might a- as well. No one's forgiving you anyways. No so right, just yeah. Own it. Yeah, you're, you're never, ever going to come back from it. <laughs> you might as well. Just own it. Just own it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and just let that group be your fans at that point. Let the people who are into it. That's true. He might him. he might end up doing uh, really well. <laughs> With a certain group of people. <laughs> yeah, all of a sudden he's just touring. <laughs> <laughs> touring again. Touring again. You can in the see South. him in Mississippi. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man, we're going to get comments you, on don't that. Don't get angry, Mississippi. <laughs> don't come on. You exactly. know why. It's Stop it. Terrible. It's because you don't have shoes. All right. <laughs> we want to thank you again for coming on the show. 
Yeah, thank you you for having me. Please, it's a blast. And where again can I see you? We see you. I will be at the comic strip this coming weekend and then the following weekend at the uh, Catch Rising Star in New Jersey. And every Wednesday I'm on Bob and Tom. Yes, awesome. I love Bob and Tom so much. I love them too. They said hello. They love you as well. They're great people. Yeah. If you're in that market, listen to that show. Yes, it's always fun. Yeah, it's such a great... And now we bring you to the end of the world. An Indian billionaire spent $120 million on his son's wedding this past weekend, inviting over 1,000 of the world's most wealthy and elite. Ooh. What else could this billionaire have spent $120 million on that would be an even bigger middle finger to those starving to death in his country? QB. Cocaine encrusted roller skates. I like it. With like see-through bottoms, and you can put like a little goldfish in there. Oh, I like that. Living goldfish. Yeah. Mm. Fed. Could have just started a new religion. Why not? That's like a great that. option. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Right. I think that's a way to go. Make more money off that money. Yeah. yeah. And off the poor. Tax credit. The tax. <laughs> yeah. 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 Write offs. Throw yeah. another arm on that elephant. Yeah. <laughs> mm. <laughs> <laughs> I should think before I speak. <laughs> What about you? I'm going to say a lake full of coconut curry. Oh, mm. he would coconut love that. Curry. Delicious. A, re- a, a reservoir of mm. it. I'm going to say uh, a new uh, phone scam call center. <laughs> Thank you all very much for tuning in. We will see you next Tuesday. Bye-bye.